Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, what an inspiring way to start the morning, wasn't it? Isn't it? Uh, I'm sure it's provoked lots of questions, and I will uh, start off with one question, if I may, George. And my question is as follows. Um, John Adair, who was the first professor of leadership in the world, um, once wrote a book called Great Leaders, in which he charted how the coming of Jesus had changed the concept of leadership from the leader being the tyrannous great man, Alexander the Great or whoever, military style leader to a servant leader. Now, if he's right, so people may have various views about that, but if he's right, then the model of servant leadership, the ideal of servant leadership, starts roughly 2,000 years ago. Why is it still so unpopular? Because the mindset is focused on the wrong thing. It's been learned through education how to focus on whatever is not involving the, the followers. And it requires humility. The question is, why do we become a leader? Leaders have to remain humble. If they don't see it as a vocation, I'm called to something greater than myself. Mm -hmm. You then have leaders whose egos get in the way of what they do, and the stakeholders, the employees, those people that they should be serving and working with, uh, they do not do. Servant leadership means I am willing to learn. I am willing to make those that I lead the first priority. And that's a very powerful question for a leader. Who, who do I make priority? Yes. Um, why is it so difficult? I mean, most of us in the West anyway uh, are familiar with the idea of servant leadership. It's not that we have never heard about it. Um, and yet we find it in practice quite difficult. Well, it's seen as non-goal-oriented um, or non-self-oriented. When you ask people, how, how are you doing? They generally measure themselves in how much they own, what position they have. We're going to hear later uh, from, uh, about identity and how people get mixed up in who they are. Mm -hmm. And the old idea of a community, the old, and Idris Jala from Malaysia, he talks about uh, having re re uh, turned around Malaysia Airlines. He talks about learning from his grandfather how mm -hmm. to be a leader, and it was clearing the jungle. He was, grew up in Borneo. And for him, the leader as the, was someone who could clear the jungle to make the community safe. They served the community. Mm. Now, I think most of us here would consider ourselves, mm. if not actually servant leaders, people who aspire to be servant leaders. Most of us, I think, would fall into that category in this room. How could we judge whether we're being good servant leaders or not being good servant leaders? Are your followers engaged? Uh -huh. Are they learning? Are they doing things that live out their dreams? Do we help them in their career development? We may have to sacrifice having a good employee because they have a different dream. And we serve them by how they feel about themselves, their family, their job, and their future. And it's very sad that most leaders, 80% of leaders are not trusted in the United States right now, only about 20%. And that's because people feel they don't, are not cared about. Caring, according to Gallup, is the most important characteristic someone can feel to create engagement from your immediate boss. Not the big boss, your immediate, immediate boss. boss. But the big okay. boss determines how the little boss feels. Yes. So th that's a very challenging thought. I wonder how many of us actually take time to evaluate how our leaders, how, how the people we are leading feel I wonder how many of us take the time to think about whether the people we lead are actually fulfilling their dreams, are aware of their dreams, are, are able to take actions in relation to their dreams, even if it means they're leaving the organization. That's quite a challenging thing. It, it takes time, not a great deal of time. It's amazing how quickly this can happen, but to dialogue. It means you have to get off iPhones, Blackberries, emails, mm -hmm. The world has changed in the last three years. In the last seven years, I see students who should be coming to a training program as a kind of retreat, as a time to clear their mind. But they can't get off the Blackberries. Yes. They can't get off the iPhones. Yes. So that they have no time be to be a, able to sit and talk to another over a coffee. Mm. And even if you're on a virtual team where you're away, in the different parts of the world, can you have a global mindset? Yes. And does that global mindset involve being able 
to understand who your uh, who is your uh, followers yes and knowing their lifeline what is their leadership lifelines what have been the tragedies in their life what have been the significant events that mm -hmm. shaped them as a leader yes. because every leader the basis of being an authentic leader is knowing who you are thank you um. Uh, I see one hand already and two hands. Any other hands going up? Okay, I'll take your question first. Mr. Chua over there. Yes, indeed. And then if the second microphone can go to Maya Gopal over there, that'd be great. Please go ahead. George, we, we're a sort of, broadly speaking, and for those of you who don't fit this category, I apologize, a bunch of sort of gray old men. and. When I travel around the world on this issue of humanizing globalization, the next generation seem to get it. Um, and somehow we don't, we, the leadership cadre of today, don't seem to be able to connect with that deep understanding of a big transition that needs to happen. We sort of treat it on the edge. What can we do about that? Uh, I think if you are 40, 50, 60, you should spend time with young people. Uh, those go to events, talk to them, get into the new mindset, travel, see the poverty in the world, see different experiences. What really makes a talented person is a rich experience. And too many people get locked into a narrow life where they no longer have a rich experience. I know right here in Switzerland, a doctor who was very detached. He did not know how to create bombs. And he was in a marital crisis. And he, deci he decided to go to India. He came back a transformed man, having spent time healing and working as a doctor in the uh, uh, poverty areas. Riching oh, yes. experiences, reaching out and understanding. It is a new world. It is a changing world. And it's never going to go back to the way it was. How do we capture the learnings from this? Maya? Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, it's just coming. Thank you for, for yeah, the fascinating... Yeah, yeah. Don't worry, it's happening. Don't worry. It's okay, Atma. Relax. Sorry, Maya. <laughs> Sorry. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for this inspiring input. I'm over here. Sorry. Um, I, I have a question because um, we were talking about the bigger transformation of society and individual leadership and had a very fascinating one um, triggered by Peter Zengi saying, his transformational work, when he's working with people in organization, he's so frustrated because they always end up becoming consultants that left the bigger inertia of those institutions to try to bring forward their passion outside. So I would love to hear your experience on this. Can we, within those bigger institutions that weigh quite heavily with their old structures, still move forward? Or do you think we need an entire new set of institutions that embody the let me just quickly yes, respond, yes, let me go to the great. panel. I know Peter very well, he's a friend of mine, I've talked with him. And we all have to deal with grief, that we develop people, we help people come along in an organization, and then they leave. We have to know from the beginning what their values are, and then be able to find in an organization a way for them to feel they can contribute. Again, it comes back to dialogue, but we have to remain po a positive, even in the face of loss, even in the face of loss. and. Uh, it's easy to get negative. It's easy to get negative. You have to work to be able to stay positive. Thank you. 